Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA slate for tomorrow, March 26th. Uh, sorry for the late release of this video, but we were wait waiting on uh, some pricing on uh, one of the premier spots on the slate. And fortunately, or unfortunately, uh, he was priced at a level that makes him probably the second best play overall on the slate. And as a matter of fact, it's probably going to be the second highest owned as well. Um, if not the highest owned, now probably the second highest. So it's put us in kind of a quandary that there are two plays that are very, very difficult to fade according to the numbers and are also going to be really, really high owned. Now, fortunately, the rest of the card is kind of a shit show. Um, there, there are a lot of ways that you can go there's a lot of unknowns and there's really not a lot of, of finishing upside according to the, the numbers. Um, so we're going to have to dig to figure out ways to, uh, you know, to build lineups, but I don't think it's going to be as hard as it could be uh, to get different. So just to get right to the crux of the matter, let's let's highlight the two plays that I'm referring to. First of all, in the main event, uh, you have Curtis Blades, uh, who is a four to one favorite on the money line and also has the uh, the the classic style that we need for DraftKings points. Uh, that being he's uh, incredible with his takedowns, with his wrestling. And, and this is exactly what you need to score big in DraftKings. Uh, we don't even care about the, the finishing upside for him. Uh, I mean, as a matter of fact, I, I can make the case it's probably better for his DraftKings score if he uh, if does not finish. But nonetheless, still a minus 280 to, to finish. Um, and as a result, I mean, he's an extremely strong play. I mean, he's going to be significantly very, very high owned, um, but you know we'll, we'll we'll deal with that in, in another uh, part of the discussion. Um, Chris Dawkins on the other side, uh, you know, what's it? Uh, one every four times, or one every five times, or so, he is going to win. And when he does win, it's it's going to be by KO a decent amount of those times. So, uh, if you want to get leverage off an extremely high owned. Blades, uh, I, I will say that you have a very strong win condition. In other words, if you do get away with it, then you know, you're know you going to score a lot and get an extreme amount of leverage. But it is a very, very low percentage play. The second uh, kind of smash play, at least according to the numbers, is going to be uh, a Kizarev. Uh, Kizarev, I don't know how to pronounce it. I apologize. We're waiting on, I don't know why we're waiting so long on the pricing of this, but um, I was expecting to be something like 9,600. Um, he's, he's a minus, minus 1,000 favorite, and he's got grappling upside. And also, an under, he's, he's, it's like minus 170 to finish inside of one and a half rounds. Fight doesn't go to decision line, minus 600. I mean, this is what a $9,500 fighter is supposed to look like. And yet, uh, they've priced him. Uh, let's, let's get to this. And yet they priced him at 9,300, which is just, it's just a misprice. It just is what it is. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult fade. Now, again, I mean, he, he it could bust as anything could bust. I mean, maybe he screws around or maybe he slips on a banana peel or something like that. I don't know, but uh, minus, minus a thousand for a, for a, you know, male fight with grappling upside, grappling upside. That's that's rough business, man. So, you gotta start with those two um, as your decision points. I mean, what to do after that? Uh, again, you want leverage? Go ahead, take a shot uh, with with Tia Nulin, Tia Lulin, But you know what? It's only gonna it's only gonna win like ten percent of the time. You know, and and maybe of those times, it probably in the optimal. Mm, I don't know, 60% of the time. I mean, it's not really that big of a, I mean, it's big leverage, but it's just a really low percentage play. So I think, I think it would start with those, with, with those two fighters blades in the main event and, and the other chalky play. And then let's just see if we can't find other ways to, you know, to, to, to play sort of low on plays, I guess. Just want to kind of show you what the, 
what my ownership uh, projections look like. This is as of, you know, it is already Friday afternoon. I mean, you'll see, and this is going to go higher, by the way, because yeah, that's going to, it's got to be more than 25%. Um, you do have, you know, you don't have a lot of, you know, a, a smash own play underneath blades and what's going to be Kish, uh, you know, Kishiev. So, um, you, you could, you know, get away with some 20% guys, maybe 20% gals. And then we'll see if maybe some of these really low owned plays are, are kind of worth it. Uh, I think I'm developed a pretty good handle of knowing where the industry is is with, with a lot of these plays. So I think I'll be, I think we'll be able to at least get some kind of edge in this analysis with respect to ownership. And we'll, we'll get to that. Um, let's just start, you know, from the bottom and, and see if we can't find some finishing upside or something out of these other fights. Um, so Saldana, the Saldana Souza is just a misery. I mean, like fight doesn't go to decision line is a plus plus one fifty. Not to mention the fact that neither of them are particularly strong with respect to grappling. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough sell, honestly. Um, if anything, I don't even know. I mean, I've heard the case made that maybe Saldana has a little bit of finishing upside. Let's take a look. Saldana's win by KO is plus 400. So maybe to 20% of the time he wins by KO. Maybe, maybe, you know what? Maybe that's not terrible. Because when he does win by KO, I mean, he's only 8K though. I mean, it's not like he's 7K. What I will say is that, if I'm not mistaken, the ownership on him is probably going to be pretty light. Let's take a look at Soldano here. I didn't see him. Is he in the middle? Yeah, Soldano. So he's at least tame as far as ownership goes. And 20% of the time, he is going to knock the guy out. So I would say maybe 10% of the time is the optimal total. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess that's not bad. He's going to, I mean, I would prefer to be maybe less than 10% owned. So it's not any bargain. But again, I'm just trying to dig around here. And I would say that this fight is probably how many lineups am I going to have to play to get to this fight? I, I think probably at least a hundred. So I don't think I'm going to get to this one. Um, Dvorak Nikolau. This is at least that's supposed to be a good fight, but for whatever that it's worth. And that's not worth all that much, uh, but, but it's worth a little bit in that when you do have good fighters, you do have more strikes, you know, and more volume and more stuff happening as opposed to terrible fighters that are just kind of dance around and do nothing. So at least these two are good that they'll maybe they'll try to do something, but the inside the distance prop is so poor. I mean, fight doesn't go to a decision again. It's like 200. Neither of them are particularly great grapplers. And from what I hear, I mean, they're both, they're both pretty good. You know, I, I just don't, I don't see this finishing. Um, but for what I see, I mean, even the numbers don't see it finishing. It's probably just kind of a weak fight uh, between this one and the first fight. I would even, I guess I would try Saldana of those first four fighters, I guess, that I'm looking at. Maybe Saldana, and then next is, I guess, take your pick between the other three, but not a hell of a lot. Okay, uh, Firo versus Maya. Uh, so Firo is a minus uh, 500 favorite, 400 favorite, really rates to win. But uh, the finishing upside is a little is a little grim here. I mean, it's it's a you know it's favored to go to a decision. And whenever you have a ninety four or ninety five hundred dollar fighter with no grappling upside that rates to go to decision, it's kind of tough. You know, um, now Fiorel has had some KOs, um, but she had a not you know a decision in her last fight only scored her about eighty five fantasy points. And I'll tell you, eighty five is not, just not going to do it at ninety four hundred. And especially when you're dealing with these two ninety-two hundred-hour fighters who have legitimately, I mean, the, the, the Russian could get like a hundred. I'm not worried about that, but Blades can get like he really get one fifty, you know, if things break his way. So it's really difficult to 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 back Fiero. Now you could do it for for ownership purposes, but I even think that Fiero will probably get owned. Um, it's because she's a five to one favorite. Um, 
I wonder if what happens if you try to jam all three in, like, like what, do, what are you left with? If you played Firo, Kizarev, and Blades, I mean, you could do it. I mean, and we'll get to another 9,100 guy in a minute. And you could do it and, 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 and play some of these underdogs that we're going to get to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess it's possible to play Firo as, as kind of a contrarian option in a build like that. Um, so that's something you could do, but I just don't see the, you know, on her own being a particularly strong DFS play at that price. Jennifer Maya, on the other hand, I mean, she has a, I mean, she's got a narrative going, which, uh, it, so this is the way, this is the way, uh, sentiment works. So she fought probably the best fighter in the division or maybe in the world in Valentina Shevchenko a few fights back. And she got, I think, a takedown and won a round, which was a really, really big deal. And so going into this week, um, this is what the content was, 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 was sounding like. The, the content was sounding like, okay, okay, everybody, you're going to hear a lot about the fact that she took down Shevchenko, but don't let that, 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 that sway you. That was just one round. You don't want to just be back here just because of that. Well, now that she's going to be ignored as a result, maybe we should be paying attention to that. You know, uh, look, I mean, I can make a case for Maya pretty handily here. You know, Fiero has not really fought anybody. I mean, she she was, was given Leonardo in her first fight, who was, was not really good. Then she got um, somebody, uh, some young young girl who was, who was, who was not really good. She, she beat her. I think all three of her fights were against extremely weak opponents. Um, let me let me pull those up just for as an example. I just want to see what her price was. That's kind of a good good example. So, Fiero actually she was she was only eight she was only eighty five hundred in that fight against Ricky. That's a little bit. I can't believe that she only went off eighty five hundred there. She was a huge favorite in that spot. And then Buena Silva, um, she actually had two takedowns, which is interesting. Try to show a little difference in her game. Only 8,900. Actually, 9,400 against someone who fought for the title at one point, I think. I mean, this is, I don't know. I, I, I just wonder if you're just supposed to take a couple of shots on my ear. Um, I think you are. Um, so I think Maya is is actually a uh, kind of a sneak, not even sneaky. I mean, it's kind of a, kind of an ugly little, uh, <laughs> kind of an ugly, um, Ugly punt play, which I think you, you could try here. Um, I'm not going to get a lot of ownership in her, but, you know, if I'm playing 100, I'm going to get some. We already talked about uh, about the Russian against uh, Julian. Now, let's get into this one, Dana Baccarel, because when I first looked at the at the card, before I even, like, absorbed any content or whatever, I'm finally getting to these fighters who I've seen before, Okay. And one thing that's a benefit of me having seen them before is I've also seen or, or experienced or heard the industry's take on them before. And we're, we're gonna look at, at, at Baccarat Dana for a minute here. So when he was fighting um, uh, Brandon Davis, he was coming off of a first round KO over, over Navidad. And he got 128 fantasy points in that. And for whatever reason, Baccarat was sort of ignored. Um, not ignored, but he was only 8,600. And he was really low owned, if I'm not mistaken, in that, in that fight. I mean, I actually, I didn't play the other side, but I faded him. I played like other, player, other fighters on that slate. And within two seconds coming out of the corners, you could just tell that he was going to just destroy this guy. I mean, he just comes out with such incredible power. You could just tell within five seconds that he was going to destroy him. And I just knew I was dead in my lineups before I even started because I didn't have this guy. And so this, this week um, he, he, you know, takes a step up in competition. He, he's against um, uh, what's his name against Chris Gutierrez, who's on a pretty sizable winning streak on his own. You know, I mean, he at 7,700, he's got, well, forget you got to draw, but like win, 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 win. You know, it was, um, 
uh, these 114 points here with a KO. So this is a kind of a pick em fight. When I first looked at him, I'm like, you know, I'm not going to make that same mistake again. I'm, I'm going to just go with Baccarat. Just presume that whatever the price is, is too low and just kind of just take that KO upside because I didn't really see too much of it on the slate. But during the course of the week, I, I heard some some takes on Baccarat, but but not that much. And with the with the introduction of um, of this new Russian fighter as being having all that KO and that finishing upside, uh, maybe Baccarat might take a back seat, you know, because looks and listen, you're going to play both those guys. As I mentioned, I mean, you're probably going to have to find some punts and maybe getting to these 8,500 is not going to be as easy. So maybe, just maybe Baccarat just kind of just doesn't uh, get the ownership. So I'm definitely going to make him a big part of what I'm doing. Uh, the problem with Gutierrez, again, is just don't see the, the finishing upside. He's 7,700. And I know that I know that Baccarat is going to be the aggressor in this whole fight. And, you know, look, get, Gutierrez could win, but it, if, if he wins in a finish, it's going to be just fighting off the, the, you know, the onslaught, I think, and just kind of just grinding him out with his leg kicks and maybe, maybe just maybe finding a finish in the third round, just because let's just say he's just much better than he is, which he could be. Um, so I guess that's in the cards, but I don't think that's particularly likely. So I think Gutierrez has some win equity, obviously. Look, he's pick him or like pretty close to pick him at, you know, 7700 but i just don't think the, the gpp upside is, is there for him so i do but i do like Baccarel uh quite a bit um with respect to the actual numbers i mean it says fight doesn't go to a decision minus 125 but the thing is is that Baccarel is a plus 165 to win by tko so there's what they're saying is that if he wins, it's damn likely that he KOs him. So that's what we're looking for in DFS, and that's what I think I'm going to be going for in this fight. Okay, uh, Carol Rosa versus Sarah McMahon. Uh, kind of an interesting style clash. Um, we do have Sarah McMahon, who, who does have some wrestling in her back pocket. Um, but she's, you know, she's, she's the older fighter. She's the one kind of hanging on to her career. And then you have Carol Rosa, or Rosa, who's the young stud, so to speak, who's just kind of been, you know, she's 28 years old. She's just, she's the up and comer and, you know, they're, they're giving her a name. Um, but it just seems like the matchup that, that Rosa is going to kind of thrive in. Um, but let's take a look and see if the, if the numbers bear that out. Fight does goes to a decision. It's, it's about a pick them, maybe a little better to not go to decision. Um, so for Rosa to be a good play, she's got to have take that upside, which she does not. Um, or she's got a lot of volume, which she does. And her pricing has to be good, which it's like, okay. Like you have Rosa, who I think is 8,800 or something, 8,900. I mean, it's close to being a good play. Um, I don't think it's as good as the Baccarat play. Uh, I certainly don't think it's good as the upper 9K, those 9K plays. I'm going to put it in my player pool just to kind of just to have something like that. I would say that it would probably take me about 40 lineups to get to her, I think. Um, then you have the other side, you have McMahon. Now, again, as I mentioned, McMahon has the benefit of having the takedown upside, right? And, and look, if you can get McMahon working at 7,300, uh, listen, she's 40 years old. She's got experience. She's been, you know, she's, she's, uh, we've seen this before. And if Rosa doesn't, uh, isn't careful, she can get taken down. And then who knows what could happen when, look, you look at these, look at these results, sub, 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 you know, she's got four out of five subs on her record in the last, you know, last five fights. And if I'm not mistaken, the, uh, well, excuse me, uh, she, she lost, so I, I, I apologize. She lost the by sub, and she won against Mazzani by sub, but Mazzani, even though this was four years ago, I mean, she's known as a pretty good wrestler herself. Um, so that's, uh, that's pretty strong. And she lost by in three rounds to Pena, who, if I'm not mistaken, is the, is the champion now. Right? Didn't she beat Nunez? Um, and she had three takedowns in that fight too. So uh, listen, if you, you sign me up for two or three takedowns for 7,300, it's just gotta be in your player pool. I think so. I'm going to probably have, I would say the same amount of McMahon as Rosa, probably 
maybe, I don't know, 15%. That, that seems fair. Okay, uh, Magni versus Max Griffin. Um, this is going to be a no thanks for me. Um, you look at the, uh, the, the fight doesn't go to the decision line again. It's like minus 200 to not finish. You have neither guy with particularly good uh, grappling upside. And for, uh, something I neglected to mention um, uh, earlier is the other thing that we'd like to look for in these, in these cards is, um, whatchamacallit, is, is possible misprices as far as, you know, win equity you don't have any of that on this card except for obviously the 9300 uh what's his name the uh, russian who should it should be 10k but at the very least since they don't price it that much they should have made at least 95 anyway um so max griffin neil magni no thanks borshev dia casey so borshev was is ha, first of all he comes in with a nickname so he's the he's the, the santa santa claus or something santa slav or slava claus that's what it was and he came in his last fight with a lot of hype, and he was he was all right. I mean, he looked like he was struggling actually before he finally got the KO. And then he did this dance in the middle of the ring. Okay, congratulations. Uh, and, and then now he's fighting Mark D. Casey, who's kind of been around the block. Um, and I do hear a little bit of love for him as far as 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 an underdog go, but it's underdog goes. It's not like he's got a lot of upside. It would be more of a play against Borshov. It's more of a play that Borshov is a BS contender and that, that what's his name, Dia Casey's experience will just kind of just grind out maybe a, a win, maybe a takedown or two down the road. But um, let's take a look at the numbers here. Uh, fight doesn't go to decision. All right, so this one's okay. It's minus 200. So Borshev, for lack of anything better, is just going to rate as a good play, you know, like, like, is he as good of a play as Baccarat? I think that's a very legitimate question, right? Because they're both, they both have, um, they're both similarly priced in the mid range. Uh, I would actually say that Borshev has the stronger. So uh, this is kind of uh, sneaky, right? So as a fight, the Borshev fight has a stronger inside the distance prop, but individually Baccarat, I think is stronger because let's take a look. It says, Bors, no, it's about the same. So Borshev wins by TKO plus 130 and uh, Baccarel by plus 160. So there are very similar plays. Um, so I guess I would kind of, I just have this kind of, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of have this feeling that Baccarel is, is safer. I don't want to say safer. They're, neither of them are safe. They're both of my pick them pretty much. Um, but I like the Baccarel side more than the Borshev side, but I'll probably have both of those. And I don't think I'm going to play any of the DK side. All right, Alexi Olenek versus um, uh, Alexi Olenek versus uh, Ilio Latifi. This is a this is a travesty. Uh, you have two heavyweights, two out of shape heavyweights. One of them about 100 years old, the other one like 38 years old. And <sighs> let's look at the numbers here. You get fight doesn't go to decision minus 190. I I I find that difficult to believe. I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I really, you guys want something? How, how does this not go to decision? I mean, you think these guys have the energy to finish anybody? Uh, maybe. See, because here's the thing, like Olenek, from what I've read, I, he, he is, has like 10 or 10, 10 to 13 or whatever, like choke submissions, the exact same choke submission. Um, this Ezekiel choke um, to the, to the extent where he'll actually let, let the opponent take him down in the hopes that he maybe will slap it on him. Um, hey, and if you're in your forties, you know, at least listen, a good plan is a bad plan is better than no plan. So listen, he's got 59 wins and he's got a he has to know what he's doing. So I think he at, at plus plus one sixty, I think that's very legit. Now, one of the, I can't believe I'm hearing this, but one of the arguments that I've heard, against the Olympic play, okay? And this is, this is really, this really happened, is this. They're like, well, Olympic is really good at the Ezekiel, this neck choke, but Latifi apparently has no neck. So that's why you shouldn't take Olympic. Like, Whoa, hold, hold on. So, 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 so if that's any reason why Olympic's ownership will be kept down, I'll be more than happy to try it. Um, so for me, it's kind of Olenek or nothing. That would be my, 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 my take. Who do I like more, Olenek 
or I don't know, Maya, for example. I mean, obviously, Olenek's got better winning chances. Um, who do I like more, Olenek or McMahon? I mean, sure, I guess Olenek's got better winning chances. So, so far, as gross as it is, Maybe Olenek is, 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 is the better, best of the underdog plays so far, which is really, really disgusting. Okay, um, next. Askar Askarov versus Kai Kara France. Okay, so now we have another competitor for the nine, the best 9K play. You have um, Askar Askarov as a four to one favorite um, and you have an inside the distance prop, which is um, just kind of okay. Um, actually, it's not, it's like pick'em. Fight, fight goes minus 190. So it's actually, it's a poor inside the distance prop. But what Askarov might have going for him is the possibility of, uh, of grappling and takedown upside. Now, the problem is, is that I can't get a straight answer with respect to whether this guy is a striker or a, uh, or a wrestler. And I've heard, you know, and I've heard different takes for both. So I'm going to presume you probably do a little of both. But what I'll just kind of look at what I see. And I see that he had five takedowns in the last fight. And I see that he had four takedowns in his last fight, you know, several fights ago against the, basically the champ of the division. So uh, this is this is good enough for me. And, and, and the thing is, is that maybe people will see the, the decisions here and, and the and – the, fantasy points oh man how do you play this at 90 fantasy points 70 70 i don't know man maybe maybe this is a hopeless uh a hopeless 9k yikes um as for as for cara france he has slowly but surely became kind of a um a very uh well-loved underdog on this card and I presume that with um, what you call it, that with the, the the release of the pricing on the on the Russian, people are going to be even more wanting to find the seventy one hundred guys. So I think that this is going to be a pretty popular play, uh, and and there is reason for that because you look in his last two fights, he has first round KO. So I don't know if you're seventy one hundred with two KO, two first round KOs in your last two fights in a slate where you want to play two or maybe three 9K fighters, I can see why this is a very, very strong uh, underdog option, as you know, as risky as it seems. Um, I'll, I'll point out one, uh, two things, though, that I didn't really like too much. Um, first of all, the, uh, well, come on, I did like, so, so he went three rounds with Moreno as well. Oh, is it Moreno, is the same guy? I hope so. Um, then Tyson Nam is really good. Tough battle with him. Roy Val's tough. He got subbed by him. Bonsarin was a really, really interesting fight. So you had Bonsarin basically took his back like the whole round. He was trying to submit him, and it was really ugly, you know. And then I actually had Bonsarin. I'm like, okay, you're killing him, man. This is easy. And then just seemingly out of nowhere, with about 45 seconds to go in the round, he just kind of released himself from the grips and just knocked the guy out. Okay. So then he came back against Garbrandt, who is basically washed, and he just destroyed him. Two knockdowns and, and first round KO. Um, while I see it being a you know a, a really cool underdog pick, it's I, I, you can't help but realize this is a much tougher tougher matchup um, than Bonterin or or Garbrandt. So. I'd probably be forced to have a little bit, but I'm not going to go crazy with the um, with the Cara France play. Um, but you definitely have to have some just because of that KO upside. So for me, um, I I will rate uh, uh, what's his name uh, Askarov below those other nine kid fighters. I would still would I rather play Askarov or Fioro? Well, I mean, you, I think you just have to respect those takedowns, even though the the DraftKings points did not, you know, get put up there. I mean, just just was just last week where I didn't play Arnold Allen for that same reason. Like Arnold Allen, six straight fights had like 60, 70, 70, 70, 60. I'll fade him, 120, you know. 
there's variants, you know. I mean, if you got a, if you got Askarov who's gonna just who's gonna if he does not bat try for takedowns and a lot of them and, and does stuff with them, could, that, that, this could score. So um, that's my opinion there. I do like, like Askarov, uh, and I and while Kara France is gonna be, I think, on the popular side of these underdogs, I really think that. Um, uh, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go nuts with. So I guess this next fight is 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 the one that people are gonna want to play. Um, this one I at least have heard a bunch of this whole week, and I'm gonna I'm gonna probably go down go down with this one. Uh, and this is this is this is the deal. So Matt Brown and Brian Barberina. Oops, this is this how bad it is. They want they want to uh, they want to give me an error. Matt Brown and Brian Barberina. You have. Matt Brown, who's 41 years old. You have Brian Barbarina, who's 34, but he's taken all kinds of damage. He's had injuries and all this stuff. You have Matt Brown, who, if I'm not mistaken, um, whatchamacallit, uh, he had a big second round KO over Lima. Um, he just basically weighed away and just, just destroyed him. I right? just really knocked him senseless. Okay. And now if it's not even, if that's not enough, you have Matt Brown against the guy who's taking a lot of damage. You have Matt Brown, who's actually at home fighting in front of his fans, in front of all of his people. And then is where I start to become sheets. All of this being the case, Matt Brown is only a pick. I mean, really, if Barbarina is terrible now, and, and Barbarina's washed, and he can't take a punch, and he's injured, can't do anything. Matt Brown's coming off the KO up, KO win. He's at home in front of all of his fans. Why is it only a pick? So I will probably be leading Barbarina in this fight, but I will take both sides. I mean, I just will. I mean, I, I think that this is a, you know, the, the fight doesn't go to the decision line is minus 200. They're both about 8,100 or whatever it is. I, I'm definitely taking both sides. Don't just don't do it. Just don't fall into the trap of just, just buying into the Matt Brown thing and just throwing hundred percent of him. I will. I just wouldn't, uh, I would, I would play an equal amount of both sides. As a matter of fact, I think, I, again, if I were a betting man, I think Barbarina is just kind of a clear bet here. I mean, just because I can't, I think of a reason why he wouldn't be three to one underdog. Um, so because he's pick him, I would figure that he has to have a second. I have to uh, pause this for a moment. That's So again, if I were betting, man, I probably would, would advocate on the side of Barbarina for just that, that reason, but that's the only reason, really. And then the last fight that we haven't talked about yet is Grasso versus Joanne Wood. It uh, used to be Joanne Calderwood. And unfortunately, this fight is a horror show. You have a you know, minus 250 favorite, which is fine, but fight doesn't go to decision line. It's terrible. It's like three to one to, 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 to go to decision. Grasso really doesn't have like an insane amount of grappling upside. Calderwood's tough enough, you know, to with her volume to probably just keep her at bay. Um, is Calderwood a good a good uh, underdog play? I don't know. A plus two hundred. I mean, what's 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 her price? She's she she she's seven k. Let's take a look. She's seventy two hundred. I guess it's all right. Yeah, I mean, I guess I'll throw her in a couple, you know, again, I probably will take me 50 lineups to get to her. Uh, that's about it. So it is going to come down to lineup construction. I mean, if you want to play as, you know, it's so stupid to say it because they all do. If you want to play Blades in the Russian, which I think you probably should, um, you're going to have to find those underdogs. And, and I think that th those two mid-range plays makes it all work. Like, like back uh, Dana and, and Borshev, I think that, that that kind of opens it all up for you. And then also you can play this Matt Brown Barbarina fight. So I think those are the keys. I think you play you, you key on those three fights: the the, the Brown Barbarina, Bacharel Gutierrez, and um, oh crap, what did I say? Uh, and the and, and the Borshev side. And just kind of just shuffle those in the mid range, and, and you know you probably don't have to play more than one punt, if if any, if you if you do it that way, um, that will do it. Uh, good luck, everybody, and um, let someone take it down. <laughs>